you the life. It's all right. Really awesome. Keep me in Thank you, GPA. It's always a pleasure to be here, and I uh, do a great job hosting. Um, I'm really uh, thrilled to uh, be on the, uh, the ticket tonight with uh, Lucia Quinn, who is a wonderful poet, and I uh, haven't heard of her before here in Florida Tree. So uh, I won't stay on too long. I don't want to take away from her time. All right, uh, I'll read some poems from Blessed Paper, and I'll read some, uh, some new things. Um, this is called Fatuous Dialogue. Was it true what you wrote in that poem? Pretty true. What do you mean pretty true? Was it true or wasn't it? It was as close as you get to truth in poems. I don't understand. Poems say things like, it was sunny when I knocked out Bobby Arnstein's teeth. Maybe it was sunny. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was Jimmy Irving, not Bobby Arnstein, whose teeth I knocked out. Maybe I didn't knock out Jimmy's teeth at all. Maybe I just pushed him. Maybe he hit his head on the railing. Maybe he didn't. Maybe his mother came running out screaming at me. Maybe she didn't. Maybe I didn't smell her perfume mixed with the stink of ginkgo berries as she stood over her unconscious boy. Maybe I did. So poems are lies, pretty much. <laughs> The man whose wife lived in his neck. Yeah. This is the story of the man whose wife lived in his neck. Every morning, he would turn to her and say, Hello, sweetheart, how was your night? And she would answer, Brilliant, what else? By which she meant she didn't sleep a wink, but rather thought unceasingly through the long darkness and solved each of the burdens he would face during his day. In that way, he was protected from harm, and affection for her swelled in his heart. What a comfort to have his wife not even a muscle away from his attention. Their marriage thrived, but unlike other successful ventures in the world, this one was never in danger of collapse. There would be no shift in interest or intent. Symbiotic happiness was the key, for he continually manipulated her, massaged her, touching her where she ached to be touched, and needing her where she needed to be needed. <clears throat> then one day, she informed him she wanted to move. Where, he asked. To the other side, she asked. It won't be the same over there, he cautioned. And it wasn't. From over there, he neither looked or sounded the same. Something in him had altered, and not for the better. She began, though the descent was gradual, to sleep lower and lower. She rested in his shoulder, now where he was meteor, and where it was harder for him to hear her breathing. Her protection thinned to a threadbare covering, more irritant than acid. He wanted to dig into her, but she was impossible to reach. So deep had she sunk into him. Would it only be a matter of time until she completely dissolved and joined the others in his blood? Where would he look to when in pain twisted and itched. Suddenly, he felt something behind him. She had turned the corner and lodged just below the hair on the back of his head. That felt ineffably perfect, absolutely right, supremely fine. Hello, sweetheart, he said. How was your night? My night? My night? How was my night? Dazzling. called Tierra del Fuego. What I remember most was how dark it was at 2 in the morning, and how angry the air was at 2 in the morning, and the sound of sobbing in the trees at 2 in the morning. My time there was not one river, not one evening, not one tunnel, not one foxhole. It was not one body, it was not one climate, it was not one of anything but hunger. <coughs> My residence was a rain of speculation and spectation, a slim shower of distance and resistance in the world and of the world, its least reflex and spongy corruption. When I landed, I was frightened but not unhappy. I was apprehensive but not unwilling. 
the land left me with the ghost of a longing, left me with a hanging acuity. Then denial spoke, and refusal erupted. The volatile earth got angry at the precious lack of shame, and sore abandoned became an argument. I didn't have the energy to win. There's a very famous poem by Rambo called The Drunken Boat. And my poem is called The Silver Boat. I am my beloved's anvil, and she is my lead. And when we are tender, that's just Cody. <laughs> A bouquet of bombs rains down upon our cathedrals. But look, they are as pristine as on the day our egos had them built. On a hopeless boat in a sea of sameness, the belief that change will come sustains us. Mother and son. I flew in and spent two weeks with the sentient patients while she slept on a mobile bed. Awake, she refused to talk, resisted all questions, shuddered her past, shunned her earlier life. I needed information to hear answers, but my request was tardy by more than a decade. A fat mad woman in the next ward befriended me, so I engaged her in animated bladder. Not the same. Jekyll <laughs> is a uh, form that's uh, been popular for about 30 years in, in the United States. It comes from uh, the Middle East and uh, it involves repetition, it involves uh, two line stanzas, repetition. So this guzzle uh, I uh, formed uh, as a found poem uh, and I took lines from a uh, volume of D.H. Lawrence called Amores, and I took lines and phrases from that poem and put them together and formed the guzzle. D.H. Lawrence guzzle. It's G-H-A-Z-A-L, but that's how you say it. Um, how many shadows in your soul? Close your eyes, my love. Let me make you blind as the wings of a drenched, drowned. Street lamps in the darkness have suddenly started to bleed. The hoarfrost crumbles in the sun like the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. The sick grapes on the chair by the bed, the silk obscure leaves, taste, taste, and let me taste the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. A wet bird walks on the lawn like a needle, steadfastly. See the laburnum shimmering like the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. I put a substance of shadow. I, all compact, I own that some of me is dead tonight as the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. My beautiful, lonely body, tired and unsatisfied, I wish I bore it more patiently as dolphins that leap from the sea as the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. She made me follow to her garden where death has delivered us utterly full of disappointment and of rain as the wings of a drenched, drowned bee. Further down the valley, the clustered tombstones recede. My soul lies helpless as the wings of a trench trail. The thought of the lipless voice of the Father shakes me with filigree and uncanny cold like the wings of a trench trail. The angel of judgment is departed again to the nearness, but surely my soul is still the wings of a trench trail. You are strong and passive. Beautiful. I will give you all my keys. You, with your face all rich like the wings of a drenched drought. I don't usually write poems like this, uh, the one I'm going to read right now, and I uh, wrote this a long time ago, uh, just before I got married. Absence. I am desperate in these seconds without you. I am frightened of miles and time. I withdraw into the dark imagination where things are devoid of their meanings by a world of total frivolity, 
You anchor the real. You make love to the true. I am bound to you in consecration. You alone have given me weight. Without you, I would rise and disappear into the vast and sensate. I'll be married for 40 years in March. That's even a bigger number than I thought it was. Okay. So uh, GP wanted me to uh, read uh, a couple poems about my family. So uh, this one is called, I had a very interesting uncle, I mean a very interesting uncle, his uh, name was Kermit, Uncle Kermit. Uh, and uh, he was kind of the bad boy in the family and moved to Vegas and you know, you know, just lived a different life than the rest of the family. So uh, this is my uncle in 1957. I can't believe you said that to him. Really? In the limo? On the ride back from the cemetery? Yeah, you know, I thought he might be needy, having just like lost his wife and all. So I said, Dad, I know this whorehouse on Vine Street. You want to stop by on the way home? I'll tell the driver. But he cut me off. No, son, that's okay. Let's just go home. So we went home. But at home, I wrote the address for him on a card and left it for him on the dresser in case maybe later he felt like it. Sweet babes there. Sadie I had a fondness for in particular. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, this is called the best banana bread. Yes. Cousin Ed was a spoiled banana no one wanted to touch. Inexcusably bruised, the kid turned rotten, descending into dice and mash and reds and chew. I couldn't understand anything he said, like, my car has acne. He means rust, my father explained. Like, I want surgery for dinner. He means takeout, said my mom. I flexed my ego. I dismissed him as unlettered, a no account, a rude. My arrogance was raging and rancid. The condescension of a 13-year-old punk has no peer. Thank God we don't stay 13 forever. I thought my cousin, drug addict, alcoholic, tobacco addict, gambling addict, a total failure. I have different addictions. Who am I to judge his? I thought my cousin unsophisticated. No acquaintance with literature or art, ignorant of any kind of culture or class. Turns out he thought in metaphor, which Aristotle calls genius. I thought that a banana that had turned black from age was garbage. Turns out that black bananas that sell the milk make the best banana bread. And as I comforted my son, and as my son comforted me, 
I remember they called Edward Dalton the Job of American letters because he suffered in his heart. Many there are who work hard and suffer neglect. All Job's? Sarah, I called. Do you take it that with your eyes she was lost? Lost in the text and heard me not. And then, for just a moment, I too felt lost. Like a child, like someone who meets with darkness in the daytime and gropes in the midday as in the night. Of course, I knew we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness alone. Any more than my uncle could have worn a different tie to the wake. For life is wind, and death is astonishing. Sarah, I implore, take the baby, for he hath made me weary. And Sarah took the baby with her eyes. Amen.